Alrighty, welcome everyone to Eagles Power Hour, your unofficial affiliate of Eastern Washington on the Big Sky Podcast Network. I'm your host, Patrick Frakes, and today, today we are joined by, I think, a brand new guest here. Uh, we have a writer for the Eastern newspaper, Nick Cunningham, on. Uh, Nick did a lot of work covering the basketball team this year, and um, so I decided to bring him on with all the craziness going on with the basketball situation and the basketball team right now. So, um, Nick, how has your uh, morning been going so far? Uh, it's been good. Um, got a little breakfast, so I'm ready. Uh, how's your morning been? Yeah, it's going well. I, I made the set my alarm right for when we were supposed to start recording. And so I made this a little bit late. So um, uh, that's Patty's fault. But kind of just rolling out of bed, rolling with the punches, and we are recording now. So um, we're here, we're talking basketball with with all the craziness. And if you've been following social media at all, you kind of know uh, Eastern lost most of the team to the transfer portal after David Riley uh, left for Washington State. So as of now, uh, I believe there has been uh, five transfer portal exits, uh, and it doesn't sound like a lot, like only five players, but all five players were the key contributors for this this team last year, uh, plus seniors. So um, transfer portal exits as of now, the first player that entered was Casey Jones, forward Casey Jones, number 31. Uh, he pretty much, it sounds like he has been getting like instant power five uh, offers. He has interest from the SEC, from the Big 12. I think Ole Miss is looking at him. Cincinnati was looking at him. You know, teams that Eastern played, of course. And uh, so, pretty good chance he goes to a big, big school, just depending on how the opportunity works out for him. Um, we have Luan Watts enter the portal. Uh, he, We don't know much about his offers yet, but you have to assume he's probably headed to Wazoo, but uh, I mean, we'll see. Uh, Ethan Price entered the portal. Uh, Cedric Coward entered the portal. Uh, he was a little bit later than some people. A lot of people, I think, thought he would be like the first guy to enter the portal, being kind of the, the team's best player. Uh, but uh, he, I'm kind of assuming the only reason he didn't enter earlier was um, getting second transfer waivers and stuff like that uh, pushed through the NCAA. Uh, and I think that was the same for Dane, Eric Strip. Those guys were the last two and the most recent guys to enter the portal. So as of now, that is all All the starters are gone, and so it's a pretty bare shelf. So, Nick, as a guy that follows the team pretty closely and kind of just – I mean, you can just let your inner, like, student and inner fan out on this one too. Kind of how are you feeling about all this? It's kind of concerning? Um, yeah, it's, it's obviously going to be a – very big change. Um, team's going to be way different. I believe I saw it's 89% of the total minutes are just gone, whether it's transfers, graduates. Um, there's going to be a new head coach, um, which Riley had been with the program for over a decade between being an assistant coach, being a head coach. So is definitely going to be a big transitional period. Um, and obviously, as a as a fan of the team, when they just had such a good season and now everyone's leaving, it, it doesn't feel the best. But um, I think you have to understand, like, Riley's he's moving up to Wazoo. He's given the program over a decade. He's delivered us some very good seasons. Um, he's trying to do what's best for his career. And then the players, um, they may feel like, I mean, obviously Riley's a guy that they chose to play for. They may feel if he's gone, that's the reason that they chose to come here. So they want to uh, go somewhere else. They want to have another chance to make a choice who to play for yeah and that's that's generally the how things work with the transfer portal era and i mean when your head coach leaves i think a lot of those guys think that they have a chance to go down and play 
for Coach Riley at Wazoo. Um, I believe Dan Thompson of the Spokesman Review, uh, he talked with Coward and just kind of reported last night he, that Coward made it pretty clear, like, his front runner is Wazoo. And so, I mean, you have to assume a lot of these guys are going to be going down with Coach Riley to Wazoo. Uh, and I, I think most of them are the caliber of player that will be able to succeed there. Um, it, you know, you got to remember, Wazoo's not in the Pac-12 anymore. The Pac-12 basically doesn't exist. And they're playing in a WCC schedule next year. And I think that roster will be a solid WCC team. Will they be a top of the conference WCC team? That's to be determined, but um, that's here nor there. So like you're saying, Eastern returns under what, like under 12% of the minutes from last year. Uh, again, spokesman's Dan Thompson. He he did a lot of the legwork here. He, he found that only 10% of the minutes from 2023 are returning. And the vast majority of those are coming from three players, Sebastian Hartman, Vise Zanke and uh, Mason Williams. And they were all freshmen last year that saw the court at, you know, saw the court sparingly. Hartman saw the saw the court a good amount uh, playing more just kind of a, a defensive presence. But uh, Zanke and Mason Williams kind of didn't see the field, didn't see the court a ton, but they, they played more than a few minutes. And then there was one other player. I think McLean had like, he had like 15 minutes on the season, but. Uh, Hartman, Zonke, and, and Williams are the only players on the roster right now that have seen the have seen the court for more than you know a minute of garbage time really all year last year. And so again, the transfer portal window isn't closed by any means yet. And so like they could, those three guys could definitely hop in the portal as well. But it's more expected for these, you know, first year freshman guys to maybe stay on campus, you would think, after spending one year on campus. Like it, I don't know, it's tough when you're a freshman to you finally get acclimated to your campus, to this new place, and then all of a sudden you're transferring again. And so I I would think that these guys are a little bit more apt to, you know, staying in Cheney, especially Hartman and Zonke being international guys. Uh, but that would be a pretty nice kind of young core for the for whoever this new coach is to build around these young guys that have been here coming from the turnaround or the turnover and, and um and moving forward i mean there's a lot to replace you know 90 percent of the minutes is a ton to replace but this isn't necessarily something new and when you look at when shante leggins left and riley took over it was a pretty similar situation so i went and did the math kind of like a dan thompson did uh, when Shante left, Riley only returned 16% of the minutes from the 2021 NCAA tournament team. There were only five total players that returned to the roster. Everyone else transferred out to either Portland or other schools when Shante left. It's a pretty comparable situation. I mean, it's like a 5% difference, but I don't know. I, I, were you at Eastern when Shante left? I can't remember, Nick. Uh, no, I'm a freshman right now. Oh, okay. I gotcha. So, you know, looking, kind of comparing it to the 2021 tournament team, that, that, that transition, do you see very many similarities or do you think it's a like completely different situation than it was when Shante left and David Riley took over? Um, I think it's pretty similar. Um, you, know, you have a coach leaving and then uh, all the players following suit, um, and it's a similar, like, very large number of the minutes gone. Um, so it's a situation that Eastern has had to face before fairly recently, and they showed that they were able to still be successful off of that. But that's what makes the coaching search so important, is that this is not an easy situation for a coach to come into. Um, they picked Riley, and that was clearly the correct choice. Um, but you have to make sure you find the right coach to be able to basically, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say rebuild the program, but rebuild the team that's there right now because only three players. So everyone that he brings in, almost the entire team is going to be 
just people recruited by the new coach. It's going to be his team. Maybe that he's taking over players that were recruited by Riley for the most part. Yep. And part of what's kind of different about this situation now is when Riley was there and in the 21 season, like Riley, we kind of knew it was his job. As soon as, as soon as Leggins left, it was kind of expected that David Riley would be the front runner. You know, you have that really kind of expected front runner in house. And it's like, yeah, this is a guy, everything's cool. Like everyone transferred out, but you still have all these young guys that stayed. Like, you know, think of a steel venters and those guys showed out. And so, What's a lot different now is I don't think we have that home run internal hire that we had last time. Uh, We don't know who all on the staff is going to be going with David Riley down to Wazoo. And so I I don't know if there really is a great internal option. I think I think any of those internal coaches could be good options for sure. But I have to think that Eastern's looking pretty hard externally this go around, which is not exactly, I mean, it's kind of new territory for Eastern men's basketball. Like it's been a long time since, since Eastern actually went and made an external hire in both shoot, both basketball and football. And so it's kind of an interesting situation because, you know, we're going to have a totally new roster, totally new faces. We're probably going to see a few guys come over with whoever this new coach is. And so, I mean, Eagles fans, like, I, I, there's a lot of Eagle fans that are, like, freaking out on Twitter, like, oh, we're going to be horrible, like, tough times coming ahead. I mean, dude, in the transfer portal era, you can build things quick. And so I I would have a hard time believing that this team is going to be dog shit horrible in 24-25 in if they bring in the right guy. Because uh, when you look at a team like uh, Montana State, they lose Danny Sprinkle after, what, two or three straight tournament trips or or big sky championships or whatever the actual stat was and they bring in coach matt logie and all like right away they're 500 and then they make a run on the tournament and all of a sudden they're 16 seed in the national tournament and they had a chance to go win a game there so you know it in a transfer portal era it really isn't unheard of to turn teams around pretty quick and i'm not saying that we're going to be a 20 win team next year but you can't just, I mean, I don't think you need to expect us to be absolutely horrible looking forward because a new head coach, Eastern's going to make a good, good hire. I mean, they almost always have when it comes to basketball. And so, I mean, I have faith in a guy like Tim Collins, who's, you know, a known basketball guy to make a good basketball coach hire. And, and so I'm not, I really am not too worried about, you know, the new coach being an underperformer. I, I think, I think we have a pretty good shot for whoever this new coach is to come in and, and take the pieces left by Riley, which will probably be very few, bring in his own guys, supplement it. Uh, maybe we have one or two kind of mediocre years, but I, I have a feeling that whoever this new coach is will have us back towards the top uh, part of the big sky here pretty soon. And so uh, I, I kind of have to put you on the shelf here, Nick. I, I apologize, but. We'll kind of shift into a few of the names that we've we've heard floated around um, when it when it comes to this coaching search. Mostly the external guys. The internal guys are probably down to just um, I would think Coach Brady and um, man, I'm blanking on his name. Harry Potter, Harry Potter goggles. I can't or Harry Potter glasses. I can't remember his name. But um, looking at the external candidates and the external names that we've heard float around. Uh, we'll hit on this one first. So this guy, uh, Flynn Clayman, uh, he is the associate head coach at High Point University this year. He is someone that's been named multiple times by multiple people, just kind of a guy that seems interested. Um, he, he was someone, I believe it was a spokesman, interview mentioned someone from high point reached out to eastern washington about the job i could be wrong i cannot remember but flynn is a guy that uh he is a big sky guy and and it's like high point university is in the big south how is he connected to the big guy um his 
previous job, he spent six years at Southern Utah University. Southern Utah was in the big sky for five of those six years. Uh, Flynn Clayman, he's known as like a up and comer in the coaching game. One of the kind of rising stars of, among, uh, you know, assistant head coaches and, and the or assistant coaches in general in kind of the mid to low major level. Uh, he spent a couple of years in Australia coaching, um, coaching ba- basketball two or three years in Australia. He sent something like 30 players up into division one uh, and then. Uh, went to Southern Utah, did his six years at Southern Utah. By the end of his uh, end of his tenure at Southern Utah, I believe he was a associate coach there. And then their head coach got fired or took a new job. And so he had three games as the interim head coach. After that, the new staff did not hire him back. He got the job with High Point University. Uh, he spent one year as an associate head coach there. But, um, you know, he, he's a very interesting candidate and probably a guy that I would be very, very thrilled if Eastern Washington was to hire. Uh, do you have any thoughts on on Flynn Claim in there, Nick? Um, yeah, I, I would be very excited to see his name um, as a finalist or even the hire because pretty much since he's come into the college ranks, he's just he's won games. Um, well, he was the assistant coach at Southern Utah. Four straight winning seasons. They had three back-to-back twenty-plus uh, game seasons, and then they were ranked in the top twenty-five um, on Kempom for the mid-major rankings for multiple weeks during that time. Um, or during his head coaching, he had one one year as the head coach, and twenty-four and thirteen in their first season in the WAC. Um, so basically wherever he's been, whether it's, um, Southern Utah, whether it's at HPU, they've won games, um, and his first season with Southern Utah, his first season as the assistant coach was their first time winning, uh, with a winning season, a winning record in over 20 years, um. I think his experience in Australia shows he can develop young players, um, and he knows what it takes to he knows what it takes to send a guy to Division One. Like he he knows what it takes to develop a guy to be able to play at that level. Um, so, and his experience working with kids of the age that he's going to be scouting and recruiting to Eastern. He has international experience, um, so he's he's a guy that I first saw his name coming up um, this morning. Like is the first time that I saw his name, but as soon as I started looking him up, I just saw more and more where this is a guy that I would be very excited if Eastern High. I agree, and one thing that. that- personally gets me really excited is that international experience because I think that's one of the tougher kind of climates for some head coaches to uh, get used to recruiting out of just because it's such a different it's a different ball game over there and so uh, like the whole recruiting system and everything is totally different when it comes to overseas so having a guy that knows what it takes like how that whole system works um he sent dudes from from that team in Australia to like Michigan State, Arizona State, like big schools. So you got to think that he might be able to to pull a couple of bigger, you know, bigger talents internationally. And I think international talent has been so important to Eastern Washington the last, you know, 10, 15 years. When you think of uh, Bogdan Bluznik, you think of freaking uh, Mason Peatling, other other like big sky MVP level guys that came from overseas and these guys that were kind of overlooked by a lot of places, just, I think they, they couldn't, they weren't found by those other schools. And so having a guy like claiming with that international experience gets me excited to think he's going to be able to find those diamonds in the rough overseas, probably just because he's been in that climate and knows where to look. Um, another thing that I really like about his, his experiences, like you said, he's been winning games everywhere he's gone. He was a guy that attended the Big Sky U uh, aspiring head coaches um, development program. It's been a very highly spoken of program. 
Uh, they've done that for both football and basketball. And, you know, it, he definitely seems like a guy with the aspirations to become, you know, a full-time head coach. And he's a guy that everyone speaks highly of. Um, when he, there was, I think there was some like rumors tweet that got posted and there was like instantly like 10, 15 people retweeting that saying like, Flynn Clayman is an up and coming star. Like you guys need to hire this guy. He is going to be, he's going to do great things. And I mean, that, that's not like an tell all or whatever the word would be. That's not like a for sure indicator that he's going to be a great head coach, but it gives you a feeling like this guy has clearly left an impact on a lot of people that he's worked with, that he is going to do great things. And he seems to me, he seems like a guy that Eastern would love to hire a younger guy, a guy that has a good amount of experience, but is on the up and coming. Uh, he's a guy that, you know, he has connections in the big sky already. I believe he's a West coast kind of guy originally. Um, but he has those big sky ties. He has experience in the big sky. Five of those six years at Southern Utah being in the big sky. So I, I kind of like his, I like his resume a lot. And and one thing that you brought up Southern Utah before Clayman came onto the staff, that staff, I can't remember who the head coach was that he was, he brought on, he was brought on with, but they were horrible, dude. They didn't have a 20 or they didn't have a 21 season for years and years. They were very mediocre at best. And then when he came in, Southern Utah became kind of one of the powers of the big sky in the basketball world when it comes to that, uh, when it comes to record and uh, things like that. They were always at the top of the big sky. Those All those five, six years, they were always there. And so having a guy that has been around kind of a program turnaround, I think is a good thing when you kind of translate it over to, to the situation that Eastern's going to be in where it's, I mean, it's a complete retool. You got to bring in, you're probably going to have to bring in 10 players this year. Uh, you know, that's, I mean, maybe not that many, but there's at least seven, you know, so it, it's very well possible that he's going to have to bring in the majority of that roster from the portal and from maybe a couple of freshmen, maybe Uh, we're kind of late in the recruiting cycle right now. And so it's sort of tough, but it's not super horrible. Um, You know, I think part of the timing is a little bit tough because you really want to have a head coach in position this time of year with all the transfer portal things going on, because you want to be able to attract transfer portal talent. Um, But I would much rather, and I, I mean, I got into a few Twitter boards about this uh, a couple of days ago. Like, I would much rather that the university take its time to make the hire that they want than try to rush someone in and get the transfer portal window going. So um, we'll move on to the next coach that uh, we have heard some murmurings of uh, potentially being interested in the job. And um, this is an interesting one. So uh, Dan Monson, uh, previously he was the head coach at Long Beach State, he spent, I think, like, it was like 14 to 17-ish years at Long Beach State from 2007 to last year. Uh, Last year, Long Beach State went to the tournament. Uh, He won two Big West tournaments as a head coach. Well, technically, he didn't win the last one because I think he was fired right before the the tournament uh, started or something weird, but whatever. Uh, He's been a four-time Big West Coach of the Year in his last, at this last school, uh, 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2022, they all won uh, Big Sky regulars or Big West regular season titles at Long Beach State. Uh, Dan Monson, he's an older guy. He's a Spokane native. Um, he's been at Long Beach State for a long time. He's not a guy that's going to be there for a couple years and then jump ship because uh, he's, I mean, he's n- he's no longer really on the rise. He's been in the game for a long time. Uh, and Dan Monson is going to be a name that's familiar to a lot of Spokane people. Uh, he's a Spokane native. Like I said, he spent like 12, I think he spent like 12 years at Gondega, like 10 years as an assistant. And then two years as a head coach, uh, he really kind of laid the foundation for that Gonzaga program. A, a, a part of the foundation for that Gonzaga program. He won two regular season titles, uh, in 98, 99 with Gonzaga, uh, he won one WCC tourney in 99 and then led them on to like this improbable elite eight run in 99. Uh, I can't remember who, where, where, uh, who they lost to, but they ended up, uh, or he ended up getting an offer from Minnesota to become their head coach in the big 10. Uh, he took the Minnesota job, spent seven years at Minnesota. Uh, and then he, he had a, 
okay time there. It wasn't excellent, but it wasn't bad at all. You know, very kind of mediocre in the Big Ten. And so we ended up going to Long Beach States and just kind of hung out there for the last like 15-ish years. So, I mean, like I said, he's an older guy. Uh, He's a Spokane native. He's 62 years old. So my interpretation of kind of hearing he's interested in this job is like, this guy kind of just want to come home, coach the hometown team, and kind of sail off his last eight years to retirement. Or, you know, that's kind of what I'm thinking with this, with the potential hiring of, of a guy like Dan Monson. A lot of Spokane people would absolutely love this hire. Uh, Nick, what are kind of your thoughts on the on the Dan Monson uh, news here? Yeah, so as mentioned, him leaving Long Beach is a very, very interesting situation. Um, I believe they fired him before the conference tournament, but then allowed him to continue coaching through the conference tournament. I assume their thought process was they're going to lose pretty early in the tournament anyways. Then they go on, win the tournament, make the NCAA tournament. Um, So... I mean, that's just a, a great story inspiring the players to, you know, kind of have a little Cinderella run. Um, but uh, with Monson, he definitely seems like a guy who, if he comes to Eastern, he's not going to, you know, have a couple good seasons and then just leave. He's going to probably, this probably would be like his final job. Um, he'd probably stay here until he retires. At least that seems to be what it sounds like. And especially with his current age and experience and how long he stayed at Long Beach. Um, with Long Beach, definitely had some good runs. Um, they were they were pretty good. Um, the year that they fired him, they went 21-15. and 15. Um, And... Two years before that, they were a 20-win team. Um, what is, I wouldn't say concerning, but just makes you think a little bit, is during his 17-year run, he basically had a 50% winning percentage. So um, he had some bad years. He had some good years. But, I mean, obviously, if he had just had only good years every year, he wouldn't have got fired he would still be their coach. He probably would be coaching at a bigger school. Um, but he has a lot of experience. Um, he showed last time that he was in this area. Um, granted, it was a long time ago. It was in the 90s. But Gonzaga was a dominant team at that time, making the Elite Eight. Um, so perhaps he what he wants is – come back to his hometown like you said and or not hometown but where he got started with his head coaching and kind of get back to his coaching roots for the last few years um i agree with you a lot of people in the spokane area would be very happy with this hire um i think it would be a good hire to I have a lot of experience coached in this area and he's had success at different schools. Um, Long Beach wasn't like consistently winning the conference, but they did win the conference a few times during his run. Um, Gonzaga was dominant. And then when he was at um, uh, Minnesota, he still had about a 53% winning percentage. They had some good years. Um, they didn't win the conference or anything, but it's not like that they sucked. They were still a good team. So I think this is a guy who he'd come in, he has the experience. I'm sure he's been in similar situations with maybe not to this temperature leading, but um, – having to replace a lot of players in his program. Um, So I think this is a guy who would come in, provide stability, and you know he's probably going to be here until he retires. 
Yeah, I, it, that's kind of what the vibe that Dan Monson gives me. Uh, interesting note, his dad was, he was a guy that was around the Big Sky a lot. And I believe Dan Mon- or Don Monson, uh, his father, started his coaching career at Cheney High School. So I, I think there's that connection there that kind of, I've seen an opinion piece on spokesmen that the people that are like, hire Dan Monson. If it is possible, hire Dan Monson. And so, you know, it, it would be an interesting story, like kind of coming back to where his dad started his coaching career. And uh, it, it would be a cool story. I would definitely not be mad at this hire. I, I think it's, you know, that stability in this kind of crazy era and this kind of weird, like Eastern's had what two or three head coaches in the last seven years now, eight years. So, you know, you, you got to think like maybe we want a little bit of stability at that head coaching spot. And I think Dan Monson is a guy that would bring that uh, for at least, you know, a good three to five years, which maybe isn't the longest tenure of all time. But uh, when you kind of look at his, his stays, he usually stays wherever he's at for, a solid chunk of time. Like he spent 13 years in Spokane at Gonzaga or something close to that. He spent like seven years in Minnesota. He spent 17 years at Long Beach. And so now I would think it's kind of him wanting to float off in retirement, like I was saying, and uh, kind of spend his last few years in the hometown team, be close to family. And, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe bring, bring a ring to the hometown team would be pretty fun to kind of end the career. So, uh, I mean, I, I like what I've heard about Don Monson. I don't know if he would be my A1 choice. I really think my A1 choice will be uh, Coach Flynn uh, Clayman, just because he's he's a guy that gets me really excited if I'm an Eastern fan. Just his kind of all the things that people have said about him gets me really excited. But he would probably be a more of a short-term guy because he's clearly a guy that has aspirations higher than the big sky. So um, then we'll we'll move on to kind of our third. Uh, we'll hit on these three. Our third one that is kind of an interesting name that has been brought up in a few different uh, conversations. Uh, Bobby Suarez. So Bobby Suarez, uh, he has uh, coached at Eastern Washington before, as you can see with the little bald guy behind him. Uh, he was on Shante Lagan's staff for four years at Eastern Washington, uh, and then when Shante left for Portland, uh, Bobby Suarez went with Shante to Portland. Uh, he's been coaching there, I think, three years now. Um, he's been an assistant behind Shante basically this whole time. Uh, he's the associate head coach at Portland now. He's kind of worked his way up Shante's uh, coaching tree or coaching whatever the, the term would be there. And so I have to think Bobby Suarez is a name that is going to get a pretty hard look from the athletic department. Being, It's not exactly an internal hire, but it's as close as you're going to get when it comes to kind of an external hire to being internal, he spent four years in Cheney already. Uh, he knows, he knows the facility, he knows the program. He, you know, it was a different athletic director at the time. So maybe he doesn't know Tim Collins uh, per se, but I really wouldn't mind the hire of Bobby Suarez either. Bobby Suarez has been on his, uh, you know, coach good teams in the big sky. Uh, those four years uh, when he was here in Cheney, they were always good. Uh and capping it off with the tournament run in 2021 with the Groves brothers and all that stuff. Uh, they've been able to bring, you know, he's a good recruiter. They've been able to bring really good talent in every year that uh, he's been a coach, but it, it's always hard to kind of project uh, like assistant head coaches when it comes to their going to be a head coach, just cause it's, you know, you don't know how big of a role this guy had on a program. And so, um, I mean, I think that's part of what gets me so excited about Flynn because uh, Flynn Clayman is a guy that everyone has said this dude made a major impact on our program when it comes to recruiting, when it comes to player development and all that stuff. Uh, I haven't heard those things about Bobby Suarez necessarily, but I, I think it, it's he's a guy that definitely could uh, could bring those things that you want in the head coach. Uh, he has the experience that you would want from you know a non head coach candidate. You know, knowing Cheney is a, is a important factor when it comes to Suarez and uh, right away when the initial kind of list came out from the, from the low majors Twitter account, um, Bobby Suarez was the initial name that everyone was like, yeah, that's our guy. Like that's the one I want And Don Monson and Flynn Clayman weren't on that list, but 
you know, I definitely would not be surprised with a hire like Bobby Suarez. Um, do you have any any comments for the uh, for the potential Suarez hiring? Um, yeah, so like you said, um, just because, I mean, we've heard all these things about um, Clayman, but they could be true about Suarez. We don't know. Um, you know, you never really know with a, an assistant coach. Um, how they're going to become as a head coach, especially when they're like, he's, he's close to internal, but he's not quite internal. Like with Riley, they knew what kind of role he had um, with that program. What kind of he had while he was at Eastern, but he could have a different role at Portland. Um, But this is a guy who in 2020, while he was at Eastern, he was named to, the National Association of Basketball Coaches 30 under 30 team. So they named him one of the top coaches, like top up and coming coaches um, in the country. And this is a, like a honor that Riley had gotten a few years prior while he was an assistant coach at Eastern. Um, The only thing that makes me kind of pause a little bit is and and this is not this may be more the head coach than him but the last two years portland's been 14 and 19 and 12 and 21. Um, they did have a good year i believe 19 wins either the year before or the year before that but compared to a guy like clayman who's just everywhere he goes they immediately turn around they win a bunch of games um he's a swore a guy where um i don't have as much of a knowledge of him as maybe some other people do that were at eastern at that time or following eastern at that time um so he's a guy where i don't think he'd be a bad hire um, he knows the area. He's coached in the Big Sky for Eastern before. Um, he just doesn't give me as much excitement as someone like Clayman or the same stability as a guy like Monson. So I wouldn't I wouldn't be mad at this hire, but I would prefer one of the two other guys. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with you. Again, I, I would be perfectly fine with hiring Bobby Suarez. Like, I think it's a good hire for sure. Flynn Clayman and Dan Monson are two of the guys that, like, just names that we've heard floated around about it that get us really excited. And maybe those guys get much bigger jobs than Eastern Washington because that would not be shocking. But, like, those guys get you really excited when you hear their name. It's like, oh, shit, I like, I like that. I like that. I think this team would be turned around relatively quick with those guys. And a guy like Bobby Suarez, maybe you don't know him as well, but, I mean, when you look at it, he has kind of the same-ish resume that David Riley had when David Riley was hired. And, you know, being, a, like you said, good point out with the with the 30 under 30 list, totally forgot to mention that. Really good. I mean, he's a guy that's been recognized for being a good coach before. And I think one of the, one of the things that's kind of underappreciated sometimes – and one of the reasons why it, Eastern likes to go internal a lot of the time is Eastern is kind of a weird place to recruit to. And Bobby Swartz has that experience recruiting to Eastern Washington. Like you think of a guy like Monson, like he's been recruiting to Long Beach. You got California, beautiful, you know, beautiful California weather. You think of, you know, Gonzaga is just this, this premier WCC program. Minnesota, that's a big 10. And so Cheney would be kind of a weird, weird adjustment for him to be recruiting to there. It, I mean, it's a premier big sky program, but you clearly lost all your, all your big hitters there. Uh, Flynn has a little bit more of that experience recruiting in kind of a weird place, like recruiting to Southern Utah. Is not necessarily the easiest thing in the world? And he, I mean, he's been able to do that, but I think Suarez has, he has recruited to, to Cheney and he's had success recruiting in Cheney. And, and I mean, 
a good bit of that is going to be, of course, the head coach. But, you know, having that assistant coach that has seen it happen before, has the experience doing it himself. Uh, I'm trying to think, like, think about all the, the, the great players that came in when he was on staff. You think of the Groves brothers. You think of a Kim Aiken. You think of, a, I don't know, a Tyler Robertson who went on to be an all-conference level player in the WCC. And, you know, the, a, lot of, a lot of guys that that – this that staff with leggings uh from whenever he started 2021 i can't even remember the year he started like there's been a lot of talent and a lot of a lot of finding the guys the diamonds in the rough and i think he's a guy that could potentially bring that element like that's been the eastern way for years now you're not going to be able to to go punch for punch with the big guys with the montanas of the world with the gonzagas with the wsus like you're never going to be able to go punch punch for punch with those guys, but Eastern's always been good at finding those hires that are the diamonds in the rough. And I think Bobby's a guy that he's seen that model. He's been able to do it successfully with leggings, and that experience gets me relatively excited for what he could bring to the program as a head man. Uh, you know, again, I would be perfectly fine with all three of these these three guys that we were talking about today. Uh, totally, I mean, I would be excited about all three of them. Uh, you know, would I be disappointed in one of the three over the other? Not necessarily. I would, I mean, the big thing is, do these guys want this job? Like, you know, I obviously having a head coach or wanting, like most, most people want a head coaching job. But when you think of a guy like Flynn and a guy like Dan, like Dan could probably pretty easily get another, you know, West coast conference job, another, whatever, uh, or uh big West job, something like that, where, you know, I think the only reason he was fired is just because he hasn't been like the most electric coach of all time. He's been kind of mediocre up and down. And so same with uh, when you think of a guy like Flynn, like he's a guy that's probably in five years, he's not going to be in Cheney. Yet. Like there's a pretty good chance that he would be somewhere bigger than that. Um, when you think just about the, the trajectory of his career and what everyone has said about him. And, and obviously that's kind of a big prediction, but he's a guy that, that's that's the vibe that he gives off. Like he wants to be bigger places than Eastern. Another thing with Flynn, uh, me and Kyler both decided to timely follow him, and he followed both of us back instantly, which makes me think he's definitely interested. But um, like, man, I totally lost my train of thought after saying that. I don't know why, but I don't know. I I think all these guys would be great hires. It's just the would they actually be interested in the job question that we don't know for sure. Uh, Clayman and Dan Monson, we have like some sort of a scoop on it. Uh, Suarez, we haven't actually heard crap. It just make it would make sense of a move for him. Um, Suarez was just on like a random Twitter list. Monson, we've heard murmurs from people that like I think the opinion piece I said saw his source had like 45% confidence that Monson was uh interested in it in the job, and then like Clayman. There's a few more, few more things pointing at Clayman being interested with the with the fall timing and in the um, oh, what's it called? And I believe Dan Thompson wrote something about someone from High Point reaching out to Eastern. I can't remember for sure, but I think I mean, like I said, I would be excited with all three of these guys uh, overall, and I think all three of these guys have the capability to rebuild this program back to where it's been. Um, in in I mean, at the end of the day, I think all these guys would be good hires. Um, do you have any kind of final wrap it up thoughts? Because I think that's all we're going to hit on today. Um, like you said, I mean, um, you touched on this a bit earlier in the show, but in today's day and age, it's rebuilding a team that lost everyone is not necessarily something that's going to take three to four years. If you find the right coach, it could only take one or two. Um, and I'm confident that Eastern's going to pick the right guy. Um, like you said, they've pretty much always picked the right guy in the past. They've been a very successful team at hiring coaches. And I'm confident that whoever comes in, um, either of these three names, are guys who 
have they each kind of bring their own thing to the table but all three of them you can take something away um, and you can feel confident that that guy's a good coach he's he's gonna be successful here um, so whichever way that Eastern goes I don't think fans need to be worried that oh we're gonna suck for a few years um, I think we may not like win the big sky for a year or two, but I think we'll still be a solid team. And I think we'll get back to that. And I mean, winning the big sky every year is not easy. Like that's a pretty lofty goal when you, when it comes to college basketball, like running through your conference every year, it's not like Gonzaga, like we're not the Gonzaga of the big sky right now. And we never have necessarily been, so it's going to be tough for a coach to win the big sky every year. Like, you know, Riley, Riley was two for three on winning the big sky. And we're not even going to, we're not going to talk about the tournament. Cause that was, you know, that was the tournament, but Hey, I like, like you said, I, I mean, I have confidence in this, in this administration to make the, the right hire for the school. Tim, Tim Collins is, he has not done anything to, to make anyone not confident in his abilities to make a great hire. He's extremely good with, you know, the reach out. He has been super, super awesome with the transparency through all this. Um, they gave us updates. They've given us updates on like kind of where we are in the hiring process right now. I think they're just finishing up interviews right now. If I'm understanding right. Uh, they, I mean, hell by now they could even have their guy picked out already. Uh, I believe the job posting closed like a day or two ago, you know, something, something like that. And so they were, they're just conducting and finishing up their initial interviews. They're probably down to a finalist list or at least have their guy by now. Uh, but you gotta remember they can't announce anything until all the paperwork clears HR and all that stuff. So uh, that that's a, that's a state state law thing that they have to navigate. And so, you know, just because we haven't had an announcement doesn't mean they don't have a guy in mind or a guy that they want or a guy that they're expecting to hire. So uh, just, just keep that in mind. Like, don't we don't it's not all about the announcement to the public. Like, I think it's more important that they get their guy in there and get him working first than it is to, you know, get it announced. Um, OK, uh, Nick, uh, I'm going to give you just a second here. Shout out your uh, kind of what you do at the Easterner and, and shout out your social media, where people can find you and all that stuff. All right. Um, so for the Easterner, I primarily cover sports, um, cover the football team for a couple games. Um, I kind of joined the Easterner about – halfway through the fall quarter, so not through the entire football season. Um, I covered both basketball teams um, for pretty much the whole year. Um, and then I've done a little bit of the tennis team. Um, so you can find my work um, at Nick Honey is my Twitter or I guess X now. Um, so that if you go to there, there's a link tree in my profile that pretty much it links to all my articles, whether it's the Easterner, I write some articles for about the Mariners, I write some fantasy football kind of articles. So you can find all of that in that link tree. Uh, I think you're muted. Damn, I haven't done that. I don't think ever. That that's a first. The Tubbs guys are gonna laugh at me for that. But um, I'll link everything uh, down in the description and all that for you, for listeners to go find this stuff. He does great stuff for the Easterner. I mean, if you if you guys aren't aware, which I'm assuming you are, if you're an Eastern fan, Easterner is the student-run newspaper, uh, and so they've been uh, Nick's been writing a ton for you know the basketball teams in a. Uh, I think there was like a little bit of a little bit of like tennis and football and some sciencey stuff in there too. So uh, definitely go give that stuff a read if you're interested. I know that the Easterner is one that I didn't even like think about for a while there. And then I was like, Oh, Easterner covers sports. Like we should probably 
look into that more. So um, uh, appreciate your time. I, we ran a little bit longer than I expected today, but um, uh, I think that's all we got today, guys. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, thank you, Nick, for for giving us the time and coming on to, to talk basketball and uh, go Eagles. Yeah.